What is up, Mets fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Mets Up Podcast. We just wrapped up a three-game series out in Minnesota. First time played them all year. Last time we played them all year as well, and thank goodness, because they did beat us in this series. I don't actually even know who won the estimate. I got to assume it's me if the Mets lost. That's usually how it's been going this year, but we'll we'll find out as we go on later into this episode. If you guys are listening to us, we appreciate you. Late in the season, really is just awesome that you guys are sticking around. Make sure you're following us on all our social media, at Mets Up on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. If you have not yet done so, subscribe to the New York Mets YouTube channel if you want to watch the video version of this. If you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Odyssey, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download, and subscribe. We appreciate you. James, I have seen you recently. I called you James again. I've seen you recently, but I haven't seen you in a day. How you been? I've been good. It's been a good day. I mean, happy football again to everybody that observes. First football Sunday of the year has been very fun and fun Sunday for the Mets, but Definitely a good day over overall, I would say. I can't believe I can't believe you just broke out Jame right now. It's unbelievable. I know. I just subconsciously I think it came out. A lot going on. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, it was an interesting, very interesting series for the Mets this weekend in Minnesota. The first time the Mets had been to Minnesota since twenty nineteen, and we shared a tweet about that over the weekend. The last time the Mets did go to Minnesota, Pete Alonso hit the longest home run on human record. Not gonna check the data on that, but it was longest home run human record, hit it all the way midway up the third level in target field. And if you guys watch the games this weekend, you can see how far up the target field that was. And he hit another long one this series. So I think I did win the estimate because of that. Okay. Because I think I was oh I think I was I think I was four twelve and you were four eleven if I want to say correctly. Yes, that was and it. Pete yeah. hit one four hundred twenty eight feet in game two on Saturday night. So I got you there. But yeah, a lot. I mean, you want to tell the people what we did this weekend before we get into the games? Yeah, so for my YouTube channel, you guys know, baseball YouTube channel, uh, did a little travel video this time. Three mystery jerseys, pick the three games that I go to. So basically, I open up a mystery jersey box, um, and whatever's inside, that's what team we had to go to. So first one was Chicago Cubs, flew to Chicago on Thursday, got to watch them play the Diamondbacks, got to watch Tommy Pham just absolutely dominate in Wrigley, and James was hot. He, he literally called... Tommy Pham's second home run to a T. He said, watch the ball outside, first pitch over the hefty sign in right center field, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, the boys have been the boys have been hot recently, but that was one of your better calls that I've ever seen. It was. I'm really good at calling things, and me and Tommy Pham have that like intrinsic mental thing going on. We just understand each other. Guy. Yeah, we feel each other on like a you know, like a molecular level, me and Tommy. And also for Sunday of the year, huge for Tommy Pham. We know what a big a fancy football player he is, but I could just feel it. Who came in the game? It was Keegan Thompson. Keegan Thompson loves to work outside against yeah. righties. He says he goes in the first base side of the rubber anyway. And he has a little like two seamer thing that like runs back inside on him. And I was like, he's going to try and work the outside. He's not going to get as far as he wants. And Tommy Pham has great, great power alley to right center field, as all of us Mets fans know from watching him before the trade deadline. And I was like, first pitch, he's going to get him. And then you and uh, your buddy Healy, if you guys know uh, Healy, also big in the MLB The Show community, you guys both looked at me like, what the hell just happened? How did you just do that? <laughs> But yeah, that was a yeah, first of a few wins for us this weekend. Yeah, no, that was that was very impressive. Tommy Pham hitting the ball hard all day. Got to watch the Diamondbacks beat the Cubs, which technically for the Mets playoff chances, which are very much dwindling right now, uh, didn't help, but we now see where we stand. It's gonna be very tough. But so we went to Chicago, hung out in Wrigleyville that night, which was my first time like being in Wrigleyville as an adult. Pretty fun, pretty fun. I wouldn't say it's the greatest place on earth, but I would say it was a fun time. That being said. We had a shot of Malort, and that was the most disgusting thing I've ever put in my body. Yeah. Um, Mark is no more peeling back the curtain for you guys. Mark is basically a child when it comes to f- tasting food, things, drinks, and everything. Like his favorite fruit is an apple. Like his, like, apples are great. Yeah, I mean, to have, for that to be your favorite fruit, though, that's just, that's a nine year old take. And you have a lot of nine year old takes <laughs> with food. And we got shots of Malort because that's like the thing in Chicago. It's not really a thing anywhere else. And now I know why it's because it's completely putrid. Like tastes like so it tastes bad. like motor oil. That's been like mixed with um, toothpaste. I think I, I think like, that's what it is. Tastes like dirty water. Like just like, fe- like unclean street water. That's been like in a puddle. It tastes like really warm street water, but you mixed in some like ground rhubarb and you mix yeah. it together there. A little gasoline. Yeah. And we, we like took the shot together and I took it. And then Mark took a smell of it and put it down for 12 minutes. And I was like, I just had to do that alone. <laughs> like, you got to do it. I, I didn't just take a smell of it. It went in my mouth and went back into the shot glass. <laughs> I spit it back out. I could not could not get it down in that moment. I wasn't prepared for how, like, I was. I thought it was going to be like, kind of like uh, for you Greeks out there, like Uzo or something like that, where it was like a very licorice type, like alcohol that's just like, ooh, like not good. This was like, I'm going to throw up on the spot where I'm standing right now if this goes in my body. Yeah, all the people watching YouTube are getting a special treat because you see Mark make his facial expressions like, ooh, ooh, ooh. It's yeah, like, ooh. yeah, SpongeBob when you taste something he doesn't like either. Also, the YouTube people see we're both in different locations. Shout out to my buddy White, yep. Mike. 
been hanging on Jersey, watching football with some of my friends today. And in his room, he has this beautiful, beautiful, like rainbow painted New York City <laughs> skyline. He's definitely very abstract. Yeah, I don't even know. He's not an art guy and there's nothing else on these walls. Where do you get that? I don't know. Probably Etsy or something. Who knows? <laughs> it looks like it could be like Yeah, I'm back home. It does look like a Target print. I'm, I'm back home in New Jersey because, again, we're doing this trip. So after we were done in Chicago, we flew out the next morning to Atlanta, enemy territory out in the Battery in, in Atlanta, Georgia, to watch the Braves versus the Pirates. And unfortunately, the Braves really just, I mean, beat the living crap out of the Pirates. It wasn't even a close game for a second. They were pretty dominant. And uh, we went out in Atlanta. Atlanta was fun, too. They're a little more country down there, a little more yeehaw, which is not necessarily me and James' vibe, if you could ever take a guess that we're not yeehaw guys. But Atlanta, like I got to say, it's a nice stadium. I think I said B at the time. I think I'm going to put Truist in A. Like if I was ranking it, it's like an A-tier stadium. Because now having gone to Angel Stadium for game three, which is when you left, uh, Angel Stadium is just like fine. And that one to me feels like a B. Like it's nice enough. You can watch a game there. There's some cool things. But at the end of the day, it feels older. It feels older despite only being, I think, like 20, 30 years old. So that's why I'm going to bump up uh, Atlanta a little bit. What do you think about uh, Atlanta, hot Atlanta? I mean, I hate that I loved it so much. It's kind of the best way to describe it. It's like it's it's definitely strange. Like we got a different experience of it because we were just there to go to the baseball, so we didn't really care about being in Atlanta. Besides, besides, shout out uh, LT's Wings. LT's. LT's Wings was a legendary wing spot for us. We uh, went there, Uber there straight from the airport with our luggage. That was just incredible lemon pepper. Shout out them. But if I was like trying to spend time in Atlanta, or if I was a resident or a citizen, I would probably be frustrated that. The baseball team was 30 miles away and like in an area that was just purely built solely for tourism. But as one of those tourists there just for the baseball, it was great because you can you can get to the stadium easily from hotels. There's tons of food and drink options outside the stadium, an eclectic batch of people, bars, live music. Just, yeah, it is, experiencing the South is a, is a strange thing for me. I was I couldn't even remember the last time I was actually in the American South. I think it'd been like a couple, like probably two ish years. So I was like, oh, this is this is, I've been reculture shocked, but. Still a really fun time, really beautiful stadium. And I just hate the stadium was really nice. It really was nice. Yeah, no. Great views, yeah. good chairs, good food options. The fa- those Braves fans love their Braves, man. They, they love that team. Uh, I, we, we should talk about the trip more maybe a little bit after as we kind of like get a little wacky. But we should get over this game. We've already made you yeah. guys endure like six, seven minutes of talk that didn't get to Mets baseball. So we're sorry about that. <laughs> but on to Mets baseball. Series in Minnesota again. First time Mets have been there in four years, and starting out Friday night, it was uh, all of these games were kind of like this weird like tug of war. And I feel like the Mets have been playing these games with good teams a lot recently. It felt a hair like the Rangers series where you had really good chances to win, but you weren't really able to get over the hump. And again, that partially that's just because you're playing a good team on the other side and just little things going the other way. But this game started Kodai Sanga, probably his most difficult collection of innings that we've seen from him in months yep. first first two innings of the game he threw 60 pitches and had three walks and it was like oh man maybe this could be the end of all of this code that sang a streak and the twins also completely stacked the lineup of lefties it was over two it was like about two-thirds lefties so and that's not something that would, is really borne out so far in code statistics this year he actually has pretty normal splits he has actually better splits against lefties and most of his pitches i mean his best pitch that goes for is like a vertical mover so it really wouldn't yeah. lead you to believe but i think it still is no matter what you're righty facing a lefty I don't care about split stats. I think they're, it, it will be a little difficult, but he really pulled his nose up and just got really, really tough to close this game out. Wound up with six innings and two, going six innings after having 60 pitches through two and only allowing two earned runs. And he did all that in spite of absolutely having the least feel for his ghost fork he's had the entire season. It only got five swings from the Minnesota Twins his entire game. Only 9% of those pitches were in the zone and only 15% were chased. So as his best pitch, wasn't really able to command. He spiked a bunch of them. Just a lot of them were really not competitive. The Twins could really easily spit on it. Could probably see it coming a mile away. A couple of them bounced like 55, 57 feet. But for that pitch not to have worked against an offense as one of the better ones in the American League, if not all of baseball, when it's clicking, especially as it has been now with Carlos Cray heating up and Royce Lewis and Jorge Polanco back in the lineup and classic James Jinx, Alex Kirloff, I said we weren't going to see yeah. him, was activated just before the game. Mark saying we were going to see Joey Gallo on the IL just before the game. <laughs> He had it. Kodai Sanga, even despite like really struggling early on, he just the location just came in the third inning again and everything looked fine. Yeah, and I, I mean talking about the growth of Kodai Sanga, we've seen how well he's pitched this year. This felt very similar to beginning of the season, maybe like a game like Oakland or even San Francisco, where he didn't have his stuff early and he just he couldn't get through. He couldn't push through the fifth inning, couldn't get to the sixth inning, whatever it was. He struggled, it felt hard. This one, like you said, there was the struggle at the beginning, but he was able to settle in. And I think for Mets fans looking forward to next year, 
being able to see Kodai Senga do that, something that we saw that he struggled with earlier on in the year. We know he has the stuff. We know he has all the ability in the world. But like that mental side to be able to kind of get through that. 60 pitches through three, two innings is so many, so many. Like there's no world where he should be able to make it six innings, but he was able to. He was able to bear down. And that's something I think for Kodai, develop, or Kodai Senga's development is going to end up being pretty huge. Definitely. And talk about Kodai Senga walking three batters in his first two innings. He only wound up walking one the rest of the game. <laughs> and those four walks for Kodai Senga, that's the first time he's walked four batters in the game since June 10th, three months from the time we're recording wow. this, September 10th. And that was the game in Pittsburgh where the Mets did have a bit of a trying series, but Kodai did pitch a gem in the middle of it. So think about a guy who we know has struggled with command, who probably is still walking a few too many guys for nine innings, especially comparatively to being like a mid-rotation guy versus an ace-level player. The first time doing that in three months is kind of astounding. And we're still on a streak going all the way back to June 17th since Kodai Sanga has given up, allowed more than three earned runs in a game. So even the day, and this second, there's a couple times, a couple of episodes we're saying this now, a day where he doesn't have his best stuff, the command's not really there, facing a good lineup, facing a lot of hitters of the opposite handedness. And Kodai saying it gets through him and gives the Mets a chance to win. No, we, Kodai's a dog. We know that. Like, I think it's official. He's he's a dog. He's got the dog in him. He's going to be a very, very good pitcher for this team for many, many years. And uh, even though it didn't necessarily go the Mets' way in this game, I mean, you guys know us. We're going to pick positives out of every single game. That's what we've done forever and ever. So Kodai Senga, again, a positive start despite starting off rough. That being said, Sean Reed Foley, who has been so great this year, finally got hit, finally came back a little bit to earth. Still got a lot of faith in him because the stuff has looked really good. But the Twins just were able to get to him in this one. And that's going to happen when you're a reliever. It happens to the best relievers on the planet sometimes. Like Manuel Classe has had a really hard time getting guys out at points this year. He was disgusting last year. It's just going to happen. Josh Hader was unpitchable for two months last year, but the rest of his career besides that has been one of the best relief pitchers ever on a per inning basis. Yeah. And just it's just regression. It's just general regression. There have been a lot of guys on base, and Sean Reed Foley's found ways to get out of it, found ways where guys hit the ball hard, but they found gloves. This time it just didn't happen, and that's okay. Also, I just had one more note about Kodai before we f- move on, You know, close the book on this game. It's pretty crazy because I don't think there's anything, again, that would bear us out statistically, but he has a 1.1 whip at home and a 1.4 whip on the road. Well, I think there, like, I don't know what the reasoning could be, but through our conversation that we had with him, he did talk about how, like, the travel is is something that's a little bit more difficult, getting used to, you know, all the different elements, all the different stadiums. And I'm sure he feels extremely comfortable at City Field. I'm sure he has a routine. Pitchers are very, very routine oriented. So I'm sure it's like, I get in the car, it drops me off at the stadium at this time. I do this, I do this, I do this. Get to a new city. It probably just feels a little bit weird for him. Not that he wasn't traveling in Japan. They they travel plenty in that league, but it is different than what happens in the United States and the consist or the uh the amount that you travel as well. Yeah, almost every single time the Mets go on a road trip, Kodai Senga is going to a new place for the first time. Like think about how yeah. any of us feel when we go to a new place for the first time. It's a little weird sometimes, like I don't know where to eat. I think my bed's not that comfortable. Like maybe, I don't know, just I'm a little, I'm a little things get backed up sometimes. You know, you travel. I know that happens to me sometimes when I travel. Maybe it might be TMI for the podcast listeners out there, but sometimes you travel, you just you're out of your comfort zone. Things are weird. So Every single time the Mets take a road trip, almost, Kodai Senga has to go to a new place for the first time. So that's definitely an adjustment. But that's really all we want to say about this game. It was really frustrating that we couldn't hit Dallas Keuchel better because at this point, yeah. he's basically like one of the worst pitchers in baseball. He goes out there with smoke and mirrors, smoke mirrors in the beard every single time. Only two hard hit balls against him was difficult to wrap my mind around. Did get a nice two run uh, double from Francisco Lindor. Two really nice RBIs from Lindor. Just continues to be an incredible run producer in the middle of this lineup, having a wonderful season, as we all knew he would, as we all know he always will. He's a fantastic ball player. But that's kind of the book on Friday night, game one. Yeah, and then game two, we got to talk about the most peculiar pitcher in all of Major League Baseball, David Peterson, because he did that thing again where he gets a lot of swings and misses and he gets strikeouts. And to be fair, the Twins do, I think, strike out the most in Major League Baseball, or at least they used to. I think it's against Um, right-handed pitchers. Oh, okay. But just... Relatively speaking, they do swing and miss a lot. And I mean, Joey Gallo on your team, that will do that to you. But David Peterson did that thing where got the swings and misses, ended up having a pretty good start. There were ups and downs, but to finish with six innings, eight Ks and only two earned runs, just stuff that keeps on adding up. And like, I know people have been, I feel like a little impatient probably this year with David Peterson and understandably so. There was a lot of high expectations for this team and himself coming into the year. And at the beginning of the year, it wasn't great. But over this last like month or so, when he's really been thrown back into the rotation, there have been those positive signs again that make you believe, or at least makes me believe. Yeah, and you were correct. They do have the highest strikeout rate in baseball by a full percentage point. Minnesota Twins, 26.8. Seattle Mariners, a second, 25.8. Would never have guessed the Mariners were even second there, or the Twins being first. But this was a game, Peterson, where you kind of felt like there were times, even earlier this year in his past, where things could have really dramatically spiraled and gotten out of control. 
like the first inning, first two guys got on. There were only two, one, two, three innings through the whole game. That was in the fourth and the fifth or the fifth and sixth, fourth and the fifth, fourth and the fifth. Yeah, I remember now. But it was just in trouble, out of trouble, in trouble, out of trouble, in trouble, out of trouble. Had to make a pitch, made the pitch when he had to make it. The Twins were rallying. You stop them before it gets out of hand. Squeak a run through there, squeak a run through there. Wound up throwing six innings with eight strikeouts, only two earned runs. And like you could kind of feel that, that first inning I mentioned before. Donovan Solano, I think, was hit by a pitch in the first at bat. And then Jorge Polanco, who drew a walk, hit a single. My mind's escaping me now. And then middle of the Twins lineup, which is kind of scary, with Royce Lewis, Carlos Correa, and Jordan Luplau. Luplo. Jordan Luplo doesn't sound scary, but he is an all-time lefty killer. He finds his way onto a team every single year in Major League Baseball because yep. he annihilates left-handed pitching. He struck all three of those guys out and Correa and Luplo on six pitches total. So from once those first two guys got on, instead of Dave Peterson, you know, kind of losing it, kind of getting nervous, not not really being able to get it back, just completely bared down and got it. And it was still choppy after that, but he just kept finding ways to get out of the trouble. And there's an interesting thing I've been noticing with Peterson, and I mentioned this the last few episodes in the podcast that the slider's kind of changing again. I've talked about Kodai Sanga going to a bit of a gyro slider this year, and Peterson has done that as well. If you go on Baseball Savant, guys, and you check out Peterson's year-by-year -year, um, horizontal movement on the slider, every single year it's gone down. Even the starts this year have seen it go down almost as we've gone through the year. That slider now is almost totally an up-and-down pitch, only moving one to three inches uh, horizontally. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's... Uh... I, wonder, I, I really would love to know the reasoning behind that move. I know, like, we've talked about it's just, like, to change it up a look a little bit here, and the gyro slider has been effective for multiple pitchers. But I'd love to hear from these guys. Like, hey, what's the what's the reason you decided to change your slider? Because slider was really good. It was one of the better pitches he had last year as well. I feel like this is just, just totally pontificating. I'm just thinking about, like, the way pitches look compared to one another and thinking about Peterson himself. The sinker has for a good part of the year gotten better results than his fastball, even though his fastball in this game did get a lot of swings and misses and always does despite grading out very poorly and like not having that much velocity, which again, probably is extension. But I do feel like yeah, the gyro slider probably in terms of like look and feel and the ability to tunnel a pitch probably works better off of the sinker than the four seamer. So maybe that's just okay. more writing on the wall, but this is all pure speculation. We don't know. Just trying to think and look and see what I see there. But it is something that's happening, and it has worked for David Peterson really well these last this last month ish. Yeah, he's just he's always got such a weird line like six innings, eight hits, a walk, and eight strikeouts. You're like, you get hit, but you also get swings and misses. It doesn't make any sense. We'll we'll keep watching David Peterson as the season goes on. Keep lowering that ERA. Keep pitching well as we go into next year on the offensive side of things. Before we talk about what happened at the end of the game, there. Brandon Nimmo swinging the bat well again, continuing to raise that career high in home runs up to 23. Nimmo might finish with 25, 27 home runs this year, which is pretty impressive for a guy who we say it all the time is just so criminally underrated. I think even by Mets fans, sometimes they underrate this guy. Hey, that was a leadoff home run for Brandon Nimmo. Really nice to start the game off one nothing, especially in the road park. You get that one, you just keep moving on. It's just the him adding power to his game and maintaining a lot of the on base ability he's always had and continuing to play decent, decent, good defense in center field. Like, such a freaking good ball player. Like, you just think about where the building blocks are in this team and like who, who we know is going to be like, who we're confident in moving forward, like 2024 and beyond. Like you could just, it's, it's getting to the point where you can kind of just set your watch to Brandon Nemo. And that's a really fun place to be. Yeah. No, hundred percent. Alonzo got a home run as well off. Uh, is it Gus or Louis Varland? Which Varland is that? This is Louis. Gus is out in LA, I believe. Okay. Louis Varland and then DJ Stewart as well, our king. Another home run. Good little series for DJ as he finally came back from what would was just a little bit of a nagging injury. So glad to see that he's swinging the bat well. Ronnie Mauricio continues to get hits in this one. Uh, it was just the bullpen. That's really what it came down to again. The bullpen. Drew Smith did not have a good performance. Uh, Give up four earned runs in two thirds of an inning. Just not not sharp. Not sharp. And your boy Brigham, while he did have the three Ks in an inning in the third, the stuff that you love. Did give up a run as well. Just Mets couldn't keep this one close once David Peterson came out of the game. No, no. And again, we're, 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 we're shooting up for the positives here. And the positives here were Peterson. Then Bats finding some power. Also, again, Mauricio, he's mentioned three hard hit balls. Just gets every time he gets up to the play, he's looking to take some hacks and attack. I really like that approach. Really enjoy man. watching him play baseball. I very much like seeing him play second base every day. It feels good. Yeah. And that's the wrap on Saturday. Now let's go on to Sunday. Day game here for the Mets, and this is another weird one for McGill. Every single podcast are like, yeah. "This is McGill." It was, it was good, but it was weird. Five innings, no earned runs, but four walks and two strikeouts. And this was happening in the bizarre, yeah, happening in the background of football. Only, also, only three hard hit balls. Like they were not able to connect on things, and it was a lot of fastballs. And that was his most swift pitch. And that fastball still sat around ninety five. 
This was his lowest average velocity, though, since he came back from the minor leagues. So the last two starts, he has ticked down a little bit below 95 at each. So something to keep an eye out for him for next time because we know how much Tyler McGill's uh, effectiveness oscillates between his velocity. But he he, he, didn't, he kept him off the board, and the jobs keep him off the board. The only problem was uh, he went up against Pablo Lopez, who we told you guys is a different pitcher from his Miami days, and he I was disgusting in this game for Minnesota. One of the best games, I would say, pitched by any starter in baseball this year. 25 swings and misses and 14 strikeouts. Completed eight innings and only about 105 pitches. Got 50% whiffs on his fastball alone, and that's the pitch for him that's usually... It's the, it's, a, it's a fine fastball, has a decent shape, not a lot of velocity, but it's usually just a way to get to his changeup and sweeper, the two kind of crown jewels of his repertoire. And he just he was throwing it by Mets all day long, and it was crazy. He Yeah, no, I mean, like Pablo Lopez, he was good in Miami too. Like, we, we need to say that. And I think, do we say on the last episode that you're going to look back on this trade in like a year and be like, what the, well, this was a, such a fleece job. Like, why, yeah. why the Marlins, imagine what the Marlins would be able to do right now if they had Pablo Lopez in that rotation. Ooh, they could use him. Yeah, right. I mean, they, they've been using Luis Arias all year. That team finally started hitting again when he also started hitting again. So I think he is a pretty big yeah. deal for that lineup. But uh, Pablo Lopez is just, he's, Pablo Lopez is getting to the point where like he's kind of like a bona fide top 30 pitcher in the league with a lot of upside for more. 100%. And he's a guy who always struggled with injuries. And now you're looking back to back years where he's had 300 innings pitched combined, not not in one year. Com- three, he's eclipsed 300 innings over the last two years. And you're like, oh, that's the thing I always say to you guys. You're kind of injury prone until you're not. And eventually some of these yeah. guys, they just kind of won't be anymore. And Pablo Lopez is ascending in this league. And he is a linchpin for what could be the first time the Minnesota Twins can win a playoff series. And in most people's lifetimes, we're listening to this podcast. Yeah, he uh, he, he just looks really good. Looks really solid. Uh, happy for him because I like Pablo Lopez. He seems to be a really nice guy. Mm-hmm. And like everything that I've ever seen about him, he's just like he loves baseball. He's a really smart guy, very cerebral. It's a great pickup by the Twins. But, of course, the Mets win this one. So let's talk about the positives here. DJ Stewart, again, shout out James for jinxing Griffin Jacks, which... Jinxing Griffin Jacks. That is not easy to say. You want to give that one a try? Jinxing Griffin Jacks. Good podcasting. Got to really like, got to got to really enunciate there. But DJ Stewart, a little two-run double in the ninth inning. Mets win because it was a absolute stalemate up until the ninth. 0-0. Zero, zero. But of course, our king, DJ Stewart, the man. Can, what can he do? Nothing. DJ Stewart, since the beginning of August, since he's been basically a regular, 10 home runs, 22 RBIs, 12 runs scored. It's 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 uncanny what this guy's able to do with the plate right now. He is so good. He's doing so much to earn himself a job in the league next year. We've heard so many great things about him behind the scenes. You guys heard the interview with him and how amazing he was and how just like yeah. cool, calm, collected, interesting the guy is as a, as a ball player, as a person. It's it, you, This kind of happens every couple of years in baseball where someone who was once highly touted kind of falls down a little bit and it comes back up in a really big way. I mean, I've been talking about giving my flowers to guys like J.P. Crawford and um, who else I say last series similar. Mm, last series? Yeah, last series. Mike Ford? No. Okay. Weekday. It wasn't Mike Ford. Uh, that was last weekend. Oh, man. I don't know. Two don't game know series. Was it Abrams? Could have been Abrams. No, I think it was. Maybe else. it was Abrams. It could have been Abrams. Joey Manessis. Joey Manessis. That was one of them. But I'm talking about guys who were like similar to DJ Stewart, who, who are. Lane Thomas. Yeah, maybe Lane Thomas. I don't know. But just someone who was a first round pick, who was a highly talented prospect, who had like, everything at their fingertips when, as they were coming up through the league. Didn't work the first time around. You could get, you get your opportunity the second time around. You don't sneeze at it. You do everything you can to secure your spot in this league. And there's no telling what the future is going to hold for DJ Stewart. He is still pre-arbitration under contract with the New York Mets. So every indication is, I mean, as as someone who's not going to cost very much money, probably will stick around. And I, I don't I don't, I don't really want to play baseball with him anymore. He It's also a yeah. fun thing that happens every year in September. As I'm sure many of you are aware, the fancy baseball playoffs are among us. Some of them have begun. Some of them are moving right now. I have a big big two weeks championship bout starting tomorrow in cousin Yuri's league. And I'm just, uh, shout out Dan, uh, shout out, uh, D Swab. He's listening to this. Cause he might, he listens once in a while. So he loves when we talk about baseball, but he hates the Mets. So 50, 50, if you ever, <laughs> ever listen to listen into these episodes, but we, we've had some, we've had some battles and we're going to do it again. But a guy like DJ Stewart right now is determining fancy baseball championships. And it's beautiful at the end of every single year where something like this happens because it's so stupid and it's so hard to be able to predict it, but it just happens. And like people, there's going to be a lot of glory coming from DJ Stewart. Oh, 100%. Uh, Wheels, one of my YouTube friends, he's in the fantasy playoffs, and he he picked up DJ Stewart. He's like, I got outfielders hurt. That guy's mashing. He's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ride that wave as long as I possibly can because he's putting up points. He's playing great baseball. Like you said, he gave the numbers in August, and the Mets win. Mets win on Sunday to wrap up the series there. 
Uh, and that was kind of kind of it. It was kind of just a pretty straightforward series. Not too much to go into with the games there. Again, I was on the road all weekend. James was there as well. Didn't make it to L.A., which he didn't miss anything. The game was two hours, a two hour game in L.A. And I don't know, Anaheim. I went to the beach. Huntington Beach was the highlight, I think, of the uh, L.A. section of just like sitting there, had some great tacos, watched people play beach volleyball. Couldn't believe how many beach volleyball courts there were. Might have been a tournament going on. There was about 300 people playing. So it's a good day at the beach. Yeah. Never bad. Uh, LA is good for that stuff. Just everyone like kind of has a thing to do. I feel like the West Coast in general, New Yorkers, we all have everything to do. Like no one's like, I, no one like bases like uh, their, their personality around a hobby, but you go out West. Everyone's like, Oh yeah, I'm, I do beach volleyball. Or I do yoga or like, I'm a, I'm a mountain climber. Or, like I'm a mountain <laughs> biker. Like everyone's like, this is my thing because I don't have an interesting enough personality to like, you know, have, so I just have to like base it on a, something I do, but California's great. After you got to go out there, spend some time on the beach. And I mean, happy Mets coming back home for big four game series. Season is wrapping up. You kind of get into that nostalgia part of the baseball season now where you're like, I can't go that many more Mets games this year because they're just not going to be that many yeah. more. And you're kind of like, I really, I really want to go as many more as I possibly can. And you're going to have, you guys have a lot of chance this week. Seven game homestand for the Mets. The Diamondbacks coming in, series starting on Monday. For Cincinnati Reds coming in next weekend, three games. Pitching matchups this Arizona Diamondbacks series. We have Jose Quintana versus Zach Davies on Monday night. Monday night, though, shout out the Jets. Aaron Rodgers make his Jets debut for all for all my Jets Mets fan people out there. The the natural way a New York fan should go. It's Tuesday, September twelfth. It's looking like it's lining up to be Jose Budo versus Ryan Nelson. We'll see if he gets the call again. And then Wednesday, if this holds, this would be five days for Sanga, so not positive on it. But if this matchup does hold, Wednesday, we could have Kodai Zanga versus Zach Gallon. And what would be Ooh. a really just quintessential, beautiful pitching matchup. Almost as good pitching matchups you can have in the National League. Zach Gallon coming off a complete game shutout last Friday, day after he went to Wrigley Field, really put himself right back into the Cy Young conversation uh, behind Justin Steele and, and Mr. 3.8 ERA Spencer Strider. And then Thursday, 4 o'clock game, ideal time for a sporting event to start. Good. I'm going to be doing the podcast wet that night. Possibly I wear my full kit to that game as well as I've lost some bets on this show, <laughs> as you guys know. David Peterson versus Merrill Kelly. So, you know, maybe Ooh. maybe Dave Peterson can, you know, talk before the game. Like, Merrill, how you throw that change up? I'd like to I'd like to know more about that change up, Mr. Merrill. Captain America, David uh Merrill Kelly, right? Yeah. That's what they call exactly. him. Exactly. They call him <laughs> Captain America. God. Uh, we don't have an estimate. John didn't give us one. No, I mean just thought about just thought about Yeah, that. John, John, John Bales on us. John, John's so phony with the show, it's crazy. He just likes to get himself on camera. <laughs> He goes, no, no, he didn't even, I mean, he didn't even text us one time today. I know, I know he has a kid. Oh, uh, John has a kid. Mets weren't even home today. He's got no excuse. He, maybe John's on vacation. I'm, I might give him, he might be on a vacation, like in a different country. And John for sure would be the guy who wouldn't pay for a cell phone plan in another country. There's no way John's in a different country. The Mets have a seven game homestand starting on Monday. No, but like maybe he like was flying home from Jamaica. There's 0% chance. John, John is definitely home right now. <laughs> he's probably enjoying his football. He's probably, he's probably having a nice time with his daughter, probably being a really good dad, but. No estimate for us. So I got. I mean, I don't know. Can you think of one? If you can think of one, ten seconds, we'll do it. Uh, Tommy Fam Exavilo. I'm in. Good one. All right, Tommy Fam Exavilo. That's gonna be it. We're gonna go with Tommy Fam's Exavilo. I have to go on Baseball Savant while we're uh, talking here. Again, great podcasting for the boys. But this is what happens when someone has a job and doesn't do it. John, well, no, nah, John, if it's not, fine. We're, yeah, we're, just, we're 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 BSing with John. John, John, John's a good member of the podcast. Well, uh, what's the secret, what's the secret word for John? Um, secret word for John is going to be, uh, milk. <laughs> oh, why made me laugh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you weren't expecting uh, it. Well, I surprised definitely you. wasn't expecting milk to be, uh, to be the one there. All right. Uh, I've got a number for Tommy fam. New Savant. Where's max exit velocity? I only see average. They don't have it on the, uh, well, on the, on the, on on the, the bars anymore. Percentile ranking. You have to go down. All right. I'm ready. I got a number. Yeah. I got my number. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Three. Two one 109.5. Okay. All right. So Mark has 108.7 miles an hour. Me, James, 109.5 miles an hour. Hard set ball by Tommy Fam. I won this past weekend in Minnesota. So now I have a two game lead in the estimate. And estimate punishment for the second half, if we keep consistent, it's going to be, once again, probably tuxedo for opening day 2024. I think that's kind of a fun thing we should do every year ceremonially. And then I now own one. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> like, it's not weird. <laughs> not that bad. But this Diamondbacks team, you guys remember we saw them and what kind of became one of the high points of the entire season where we went out there beginning of July, had a really fun season out there. Francis Alvarez had a really dramatic home run. Felt like the kind of point that the season might have turned. Felt like it could have turned. Felt like for a half second it was turning. Didn't turn. Did not turn. But 
No. They're a fun team. They're competing for a playoff spot. Um, got again, respect teams competing for playoff spots. And the uh, Diamondbacks are doing that right now. We we had the privilege of seeing Jordan Lawler, very highly touted Diamondback shortstop prospect, make his major league debut last Thursday. Really cool to see him. He just looks like he's gonna be an exciting player. Physical tools are off the charts. Some swing and miss in his game, but I don't think it's that much that's really gonna stop him. He's only 21 years old, so I don't think we're gonna see this like star level from him for a few years. He's not a prospect on level of like, say, like the Corbin Carroll's, the Jason Dominguez's of the world, but good ball player. Definitely gonna be a good guy to check out the field this week. Uh, Gabriel Moreno is an exciting prospect who I think I'm higher on than Mark. He's really done a lot in the second half to improve his proof of standing as a player. Corbin Carroll's also gotten super hot again, been great the last couple of months. Cattell Marte, Tommy Pham, Christian Walker is a hell of a ball player. A lot of exciting players in this club. Yeah, and we saw Ryan Nelson's like best start of his career in Chicago. Yeah. So hopefully that completely goes back to the Ryan Nelson that we know where he gets shelled. Because as you said, like, watch this guy. He throws a real soft fastball, and then he had a great he does, game. Yeah. <laughs> Another James Chase. Yeah, we tried to. I mean, I still, I still like Ryan Nelson. He throws four pitches. A couple of them look above average. I have him oh! What? You know who's coming to City Field? I was about to say it. Mr. Paul. Paulie Seawald, my enemy. Yeah, Mark's mortal enemy. So if you guys are into the field this week, you know how much Paul Seawald loves Mets fans, you know? Let them know. I don't. I don't know if I'm allowed to call for booing of Paul Seawald, but I'm going to call for it. Everyone should boo Paul Seawald as soon as he wa- steps on the field. I saw some things from Dave Peterson, and Tyler McGill that were fun. A lot of good things from Kodai. Um, just uh, some other couple of housekeeping things. Binghamton Mets clinched the playoffs on Sunday. Woo-woo. Big for them. At the same day, the Brooklyn Cyclones were eliminated, which is a shame. But definitely, guys, check in future of Flushing because this Binghamton team is blazing hot right now. Hottest team in the Eastern League. Looks like we could have, Gilbert. Looks like we could have a championship run on our hands. We'd love to find our way out there. Future Flushing, Vito and John's podcast. Check them out because I'm sure there's going to be a lot to talk about the Bingham next, Mets next couple weeks. They got five great pitchers in that rotation. Could be a lot of stuff. Maybe a cha- possible championship run on their hands. We'll see if anything from the Cyclones winds up at Binghamton now that they are, they're eliminated and we're trying to make a run over there. It's a really fun team over there. I shout out my buddy Ross, too. He asked me a lot of questions about podcasting of the last few years. Or a couple, I think it was a year ago, about a year ago, something like that. He got a job in marketing with Binghamton. He was like, you guys got to come oh. for the playoffs. I was like, oh, maybe we will, honestly, because right. I think the Binghamton Mets are kind of electric right now. One of the be- one of the best shows in sports. So I would like to see that. And now, how do we get to Binghamton? We're going to, because we, neither we're, of us own a car. We're going to we're gonna have to figure that out. Okay. We're going to find a way. Okay. If it happens, you, we'll find a way. You know a guy. You know a guy. Yeah, there was no guy. But the other thing I want to say right now, football is starting. And we saw, since we talked to you guys last Thursday night, NFL football, the Lions beat the defending champion Chiefs to open up the year. Huge win for Dan Campbell and the boys. Jared Goff, uh, David Montgomery, all my J- Jameer Gibbs truth is out there. I'm really sorry. You might have to wait a few weeks. But I think there is something that a lot of us in sports, especially the Mets right now, could learn from the Lions in terms of how you like how we should face approach the end of the year as fans, especially. Two years ago, 2021, the Lions were 2-13-1 heading into the last game of the year. Dan Campbell was still the coach. Jared Goff was still the quarterback. They had just traded their best player, Matt Stafford, and things looked bleak as they always have for the Detroit Lions. A loss in week at the time, 16, or week 17, 16th game of the year. Oh, no. Was that the beginning of 17 game schedule? Yeah. yeah, sure. A loss in the last week of the season for them would have guaranteed a number one overall pick. And at the time before the pre draft process, that was Aiden Hutchison. Aiden Hutchison is yep. a Michigan boy. He went to Michigan. Everything looked like you can't, you can't lose the opportunity to take this guy. And you know what the Lions did that last week of the year? They went out there with their hair on fire and they beat their arch rival, Green Bay Packers, in the last game of the year. They blew the chance number one overall pick. They wanted to pick number two that year. And a lot of their fans were really frustrated by the fact that they went out and won what was, quote unquote, a meaningless game and lost their draft pick. But you know what happened? Aiden Hutchinson wound up dropping number two in the draft because the Jaguars yep. fell in love with Trayvon Walker because he had traits instead of Aiden Hutchinson, who was just a monster. Aiden Hutchinson right now is the far superior player to Trayvon Walker. And yes. that play, I think, kind of defined what this Detroit Lions team has become. And again, this is football talk, so we're going to stop this like two minutes because I know how much you guys hate football talk. That win kind of reset where the Lions were as a team, as a culture, like kind of how they were, I feel like, viewed a little bit in pop culture as well, where... Yeah, they came out and said, we don't care. We don't care what's happened this year. We don't care what's going to happen ever. We are going to play our best as much as we can. And I think that is something that I want to take to the rest of the season as Mets fans. Could play some games, win some games, be competitive, do everything you can, and, and just make us feel as good as possible, confident as possible, ready as possible, as much momentum as we possibly can, bring it to next year. Let's let's be mad at the end of the season because we were close to making the playoffs. We're like, we almost did it. We played so well towards the end. We got close. I'd love to be mad about that because that means a lot of good things are happening. Build upon the positives. 
keep playing good baseball. We have so many good young players on this team to be able to see the growth and the development from guys like Alvarez, Beatty, Mauricio, Vientos, as the year goes on, to see our pitchers continue to pitch better and better, the relief pitcher, whatever it's going to be, the positives are super important. And like you said, it just shows a lot about the team. It shows a lot about the culture. It shows a lot about the manager. It shows a lot about everything, how the team, the team ends. And ending strong is just such a, it's a good thing for everybody involved to do. Yes, and... Winning, winning games in sports is never a bad thing. I know like, a lot of people are yeah. obsessed with the concept of tanking and about your draft pick. First of all, Sam will be drafted. Tanking's for losers. It is. If you want to look, uh, trust the process. Look how the process worked out. Doesn't matter. Yeah. If you want to win, if you want to win the future, you have to win in the present. I, I just made that up right now. That's it. That's a James Shiano. I like it. Yeah. Stamp. Original. Bang. And you know what? We're going to leave you with that. We're going to leave you with that as the last little tidbit of information that we dropped for you guys. Make sure you're following us on our social media at MetsUp on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Subscribe to the New York Mets YouTube channel for the video version of what you're listening to. And if you're listening, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Odyssey, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download and subscribe again. Super thankful for all you guys still listening here late in the season. We know football starting up. It's the fall season. Baseball starting to wind down. But we appreciate you all hanging out and still supporting the show. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. James, what's your Twitter? Follow me on Twitter at James underscore Shiano. Mark at Giraffe Neck Mark with a C. The only right way to spell it. There you go. Thank you guys for listening and watching. And we'll catch you after the next series. Peace. Peace out, guys. See you next time.